and welcome to Good Game Spawn Point, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. And I am Darren. Coming up on the show, we have two reviews, one of which is Puzzle and Dragon Z plus Puzzle and Dragon Super Mario Brothers Edition. <laughs> Say that five times fast. Okay, Puzzle and Dragon Z plus Super... Oh, it's hard. Affirmative. <laughs> And the amazing build em up that is City Skylines. Now with added tunnels! Oh, we built this city. Ba, ba. We built this city on rock and roll. <laughs> Planning electricity grids has never been so fun. Oh, it's always exciting, Bajo. High voltage power lines and renewable energy sources. <laughs> also on the show, Goose checks out an event that teaches high school students how to code. But before all that, Darren, a test of your knowledge, please. Oh, affirmative. Uh, Spawnlings, time to concentrate. It's Darren's challenge. <laughs> Today, I'm asking you this. What is the name of the evil chef in Octodad, Dadliest Catch? Answer at the end of the show. No octopus is safe around a sushi chef. Now, how about some news with Goose? Affirmative. I like Goose. We all like Goose. Thanks, guys. Goose here with all the gaming news from around the world. The planned Wii U version of the recently launched racing simulator Project Cars is having a rough time in development. The Wii U version has already been delayed multiple times and now the developer has revealed that the game is currently only running around 23 frames per second, well below the 30 frames per second that's needed for smooth gameplay. As a result, they're considering the idea of simply waiting until Nintendo's next console comes out and releasing it on that instead. If they don't hear anything about the new console soon though, they will try to get the game running on the Wii U, but with a significant cutback on the quality of the graphics. Are you a giant? Do you prefer the old retro Game Boys to these new fandangled 3DS contraptions? Well, there's a Belgian gamer known as Raz who has you covered. He built himself this extra, extra, extra large Game Boy using a laser cutter, some wood, a Raspberry Pi, and an old 19-inch monitor, much bigger than the 2.6-inch screen on the original. And he did all this in just a month. I wonder how many batteries that thing would take. Anyway, that's all the news for this week. Back to you guys. All right, guys, it's time for, hang on, it's quite a long name, <gasps> Puzzle and Dragon Z plus Puzzles and Dragons Super Mario Brothers Edition. <laughs> Nicely done, Bajo. Let's roll the montage so you can get your breath back. <sighs> Dragon series is one we've been waiting a long time for in Australia. It's been one of the most popular free-to-play games on smartphones and tablets in other parts of the world like Japan, America and Europe for a few years now. And now we can finally play it here thanks to this 3DS version. Oh, affirmative. Better late than never, Hex. Oh, and the good news is that we get two versions of its puzzle-matching mayhem on the same cartridge. Uh, firstly, there's Puzzle and Dragon Z, which casts the player as a young dragon trainer learning how to fight monsters with his team of dragons. Yeah, and that version reminded me a bit of Pokemon. Then there's the Super Mario Brothers version, which uses the same gameplay, but wraps it up in a much simpler story of Bowser kidnapping Princess Peach. Never heard that one before. <laughs> Classic Bowser. All right, well, let's explain how it works. On the bottom screen of your 3DS, you'll be matching colors of three or more in a line. The more you can match and combo together, the more damage your team will dish out. It may look simple, but there is so much strategy to it. Uh, affirmative. Uh, the basic concept is to connect the opposite element to the enemies you're fighting. Uh, for example, enemies with the green wood element are especially vulnerable to fire. Uh, so the more flame flowers you can connect against them, the better. Uh, and on top of that, your damage will be multiplied by each team member who has the same element you're connecting. So you'll want to pre-select your team with the right elements before each level. If this sounds complicated, it's because it is. Guys, at first I thought I could play this like a normal puzzle game and just rely on reflexes alone. 
But simply connecting three won't get you anywhere unless you've planned it out well. Yeah, even after playing for a few days now, I feel like I've got a long way to go to master it. But it's really rewarding to set up a board and then unleash a huge combo. I can see why this take on the match three formula has been so popular in other countries. It's a whole other layer of strategy. Out of the two versions, I prefer the Super Mario Bros. edition because it gets straight to the action, compared to the more RPG-style levelling of Puzzles and Dragons Z. Really? I'll stick to the classic Puzzle and Dragons things. I mean, who doesn't want to train dragons? Plus, the world's being pulled apart into giant jigsaw pieces. I mean, that was just more interesting to me. Yeah, I hadn't seen that before. But whichever version you choose, you're in for some superb puzzling. I'm giving it four out of five stars. Yeah, there is no denying that this is a very well-designed game. But I was also a little bit disappointed that this version wasn't more substantial. I mean, it is essentially a smartphone game on the 3DS. So I'm giving it three out of five stars. And now it's time for a field story with Goose. Roll the tape, Karen. Oh, oh. Thanks guys, I'm here at the University of Technology Sydney where today an event's being held to teach kids the wonderful art of coding. Let's go check it out. So I'm here with Sarah who's one of the organisers of the event. Sarah, what exactly is We Speak Code? We Speak Code is an initiative to teach kids around the country how to code. So we've got 7,000 students this week learning to code for the very first time um, all around New South Wales. And what are you hoping that the kids that come here today can get out of this event? I hope that they understand the, the things that they can do uh, with code. Whether or not they go off and become computer scientists and are amazing coders, whether they go off and build the first amazing game for their, for their, their school, or whether they just know what technology can do, I hope this is the moment that teaches them how they can make amazing possible. So Sarah, Lucy, what are you guys learning here today? So when we came here, um, they were really friendly and we came in and we saw a couple of the games that they made and we've like been asking questions with the gamers and, and we've been asking how like they develop it. There's a formal session where they're going to learn how to build a game. So all the students will have built a game today. And then we have in our, uh, an expo area for students to come and talk to people who have either used code to make something amazing or uh, started where they were at school and have a career in, in uh, computer science. And have you guys had any experience with coding before, Sarah? Uh, we had a little bit of experience, but watching coming to this place gives us more of an inspiration to do more and to um, code more. I did a, some basic coding in high school, like in an IT class, and it basically it was very basic. However, you can still get the general idea of what it's about, and it was quite fun making like calculators and stuff like that. Why is code so important these days? Yeah, code is fundamental to pretty much everything that runs our lives, and 50% of jobs today they need uh, an understanding of technology, whether it's a deep understanding or uh, enough to know what's possible. The thing is, the students actually want it. Like We're seeing something like two-thirds of students that we surveyed in Australia want to learn more about code. If they understand already how important you know, technology is, or just how innate it is to the things that we do every day. It's giving us an insight into um, how much like we can achieve like with this coding stuff, yeah, and um, like there's many jobs out there for it and um, how much it shapes the world. I'm definitely getting into this. I'm going to do a computer science degree at university, so I hope that'll be very good for me. At the start, I was just like, what am I doing here? I'm never going to compete with these people. And then they told me, like, you don't have to be a genius to do this. You just have to be really determined and in creativity that can make you do these things. Well, since young people are very interested in video games, it's very good that they learn how to code. And then basically they can make their own games and show off to their friends. And it's really, it's really good experience. Our lives will change for the better because of you know, students who understand code and have great imagination and dream big to, to make our lives just that much more magical and, and wonderful. Thanks, Goose, and good luck to all those young coders. Right, now it's time for you two to go answer some questions at the Ask Spawn Point desk. <laughs> oh! Up and away he flies. Ba, 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 da, ba, 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 OK, first up this week, we have this one from Miss Tyrius, who is in Cool Town, Victoria. Miss Tyrius, Miss Tyrius. Sounds a lot like mysterious, doesn't it? 
Yes, well, I think that's what she was going for, Bajo. Oh, how mysterious. In Cool Town? That place sounds awesome. I belong there. It's Noob Cub time in the Darren Report. Darren mispronounced Pokemon a few times. Also, the Minecraft seeds don't work on all platforms. PC will give you a different world than iOS, for example. And lastly, when explaining the Legend of Zelda series, you showed footage of Link, not Zelda. P.S. Love your show. Oh, he does say things strangely sometimes, doesn't he, Hex? Yeah, he always seems to call them Pokemon rather than Pokemon and Kinect instead of Connect. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. You know what? I think we should get him to drink from the Noob Cup. I think we should. For all the things he's mispronounced no, over the years. No, last time we did that, he robo-spewed everywhere, remember? I don't want to happen that again. That's all right, we'll get Goose to clean it up. Hello. Darren. Hello. Bajri here, how's it going? Oh, oh, Have a good day? Yeah, cool. Uh, so we think you should drink from the Noob Cup because you've been mispronouncing lots of words forever. Yeah, like Pokemon. Yeah, one big gulp of the... Oh, we'll get a new bucket. We'll get a new bath for you. Negative. Pokemon is short for pocket monsters. So the correct pronunciation would emphasise the pock from pocket. You don't call them pockets, do you? Don't have pockets in your trousers. Well, no, but it's not spelt Pokemon. It's Pokemon. And I think generally that's how everyone pronounces it. Well, everyone is wrong. Yeah, of course, Darren. Everyone is wrong but you. Affirmative. Well, okay. Well, we'll let you off this time, Darren, but mostly because I just don't want you to robo-spew everywhere like you did last time because that was gross. Yeah. <laughs> oh, excellent. Oh, also, I couldn't help but overhear the spawn link pointed out that Minecraft seeds change on each platform. And guess what I found? What, what? That Darren is a noob is a great seed on every platform? <laughs> Negative. I think you'll find that seed is rather boring and ordinary on the console versions. Oh. Whereas if you use the tube, which, if you remember, is a portmanteau of Bajo and Noob, <laughs> you'll spawn quite close to a large village with plenty of farms. <laughs> the tube, that's a great seed. It is a terrible seed. I don't think anyone's <laughs> going to want to use that seed, Darren. It's, it's like a desert village. That's all sandy. Uh, who wants a sandy village, right? 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 I do. Right? right? It's close to a variety of other biomes, so I think the spawnlings will find it's an excellent and diverse location for a village. Uh, so there you go, spawnlings. If you're playing on console, use the Bajube seed. Well, maybe you should just maybe play on PC. You know, PC, that Bajube seed doesn't doesn't come up like that. And, you know, on PC, there's lots of options. Most people play on PC. It's a great place to play Minecraft. Really. Bajube. No, no, oh, Bajube. Darren. Oh, Darren, you're breaking up. Bajube. <laughs> hey, don't use that seed. Mm. It looks like a pretty good seed, though. No, it wasn't. Moving on! Chop, chop! <laughs> Hanks, you don't have time for those silly stuff. Let's uh, let's move on to the next question. I'll talk about the Jube anymore. All right, well, on to your last point about us showing Link and not Zelda. Well, we are well aware of the difference between Princess Zelda and Link. Yes, it is a common mistake, but yes, we are well aware, of course. And, and you know, we were just using a bit of footage to show the Legend of Zelda games in general, rather than trying to give a specific example of Zelda. Yeah, all right. Well, moving on to this one now from Popzin1000, who is in Orange, New South Wales. That's where oranges are born. Is it? Yeah. Hey, good game. I have a few questions. One, on Robocraft, how do you make a vehicle that can drive around without falling over? Two, since the Xbox One is out, does that mean they will stop making games for the Xbox 360? Three, in Minecraft, how can you make robots that move off pistons? Four, are there ever going to be any competitions coming up on your show? Five, on new Super Mario Bros. 2 Nintendo 3DS XL, how can you get 99 big stars to enter the star world? Banjo, do these as... Tears! <laughs> P.S. Darren is a noob! Bye. Well, Pops in 1000, the best way to make sure your vehicle doesn't fall over is to give it a wide wheelbase and make sure its centre of gravity is quite low. Indeed. If you build a tall robot, then as soon as you accelerate, you're probably going to fall over. So try to make it nice and flat and low down to the ground. And if you're still falling over, then try and put some of the wheels out further to help stabilise it. As for if they'll stop making games on 360 now that the Xbox One is out, well, 
unfortunately, yes. Now that new consoles have been out for a while, we're seeing fewer and fewer games coming out on the older consoles. Yes, yeah, so they will still be getting new games for a while yet, though. Stuff like LEGO Dimensions and plenty of the year's biggest games are coming to the PS3 and 360. Yeah, but developers have definitely begun to shift focus exclusively to the new consoles. For example, the new Need for Speed is only coming to the newer consoles. And I'm pretty sure studios at Sony and Microsoft have all shifted onto the new consoles. So I wouldn't expect stuff like Forza 6 or the new Ratchet and Clank to end up coming to those older consoles anytime soon. But of course, there are still loads of great old games on those consoles that are still worth checking out. Yeah, and as for making robots in Minecraft that move off pistons, well, to be honest, we've never made one, so we're not quite sure how to do it, but we have seen that it is possible. Yeah, we'd suggest maybe downloading this mega gargantua robot and having a look at how it works. It looks crazy complicated, though, and took over 60 hours to build. Well, that's a lot of hours. Also, we probably will do more competitions. We haven't got any plans at the moment, but I'm sure something will come up at some point. Hmm. As for how to get the 90 stars you need to enter the star world, well, we don't really have time to tell you the location of 90 of them. Yeah, but you can find three stars in each world, and there's a total of 219 stars in the game. So if you just go through each level and keep an eye out for them, you should be able to collect enough. Hmm. And if you're really struggling to get enough, then you can always resort to looking at a guide. But on that note, we're actually out of time for this week, so if you'd like to ask us a question, then you can go here and send it in. It's just a peaceful hex without the phone here. We should leave the phone out more often. Oh, sometimes we have questions we really do need to ask Darren about. This is true. So yeah. I think one phone is good. Where, where did you put it? I don't know. Let's go find it. I can't see it anywhere, Hex. Ow! Don't leave it on the floor, Bajo! Whoa, looking sharp there, Darren. What's with the outfit? Oh, what, this? It's just a little something I threw on because you can't be a city skyline's mayor if you're not dressed the part. Hang on a sec, Darren. Do we get outfits too? Of course. Just look under your seats. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, man, these again. <laughs> you can't build a city without workers. Now, let's get building. We built this city. We built this city on rock and roll. Uh, other way around, Bajo. Other way. No, no, the. Yeah, that's fine. So we actually reviewed this on our big show on ABC2 a while back, but we thought it was hands down one of the best city builders we've ever played, and we both gave it four out of five. Yes, it has all the tools virtual mayors could want to build the cities of their dreams, and it gives them plenty of space to build it in. There's just been a free update that added in tunnels and European-style cities too, so it seemed like the perfect time to jump back in and revisit it for you, Spawnlings. We should just quickly go over the basics first, though. So, much like any city builder, you get an empty plot of land and start painting on some roads and zones for residential, commercial and industrial buildings. Then you'll need a few utilities like power plants and water pumps to make everything work. Then you can sit back and watch your city grow. There's no end to the game, nor is there any way to win. But you do have goals. Mainly, you want to be growing your city and increasing its population. Uh, because as your population hits certain milestones, you'll unlock extra services, more advanced buildings, and new areas to build in. Uh, but once your city grows big enough, you'll find the real challenge is dealing with traffic. Beep, beep. Yes, residents need to get to work and go about their lives. Industry needs to import and export goods. And shops need to get those goods on their shelves. Not to mention garbage trucks and emergency vehicles and buses and everything else that needs to get where it's going. And all of this can create chaos if your roads aren't ready for it. Guys, there's such a satisfying challenge to this game, to getting everything running smoothly. But Darren, I bet you've got some tips for us on how to build a better city. Oh, well. I've actually compiled a small list of Darren do's and Darren don'ts to help. <clears throat> Don't build too much to start with. If you build too many roads and services too quickly, you'll go bankrupt before you know it. And that's a Darren don't. It is a good idea to pause the game as you design your first area. Otherwise, as soon as you start building, upkeep costs will begin to drain your treasury. Pausing your game is highly recommended and a down do. 
water currents are fully simulated, so make sure your water pumps are upstream of your sewage outlets. Poo in the water? <laughs> you better believe that's a Darren don't. Ugh, poo. Take the time to learn what roads are right for the job. Try to use highways as the main spine of your city's roadways. Oh, and avoid building intersections and traffic lights as much as possible. Large roundabouts are excellent for distributing traffic. One-way roads used wisely will also help keep things flowing smoothly. Efficient roads are a big down do. Don't overcomplicate your public transport. Try to let different services complement each other. Uh, for example, have a bus line look after a single neighbourhood, but connect it to other bus or metro lines. Don't try to have one line cover an entire city. That's a darren don't. Try to make your industrial areas self-contained. Uh, make sure they have direct access to major highways so they won't require trucks to go through the rest of your city. Residents are not fond of living next to loud or dirty industrial zones either. Well-placed and well-designed industrial parks are a darren do. That's a lot of things to remember, Darren. Well, that's just the tip of the tips and tricks iceberg, Barjo. My best advice for sportlings is to just try things and see what works. Uh, but it can be a smart idea to download other players' cities to see how they've handled various problems and get some inspiration. Yeah, one of the things I really loved about this was how easy it was to download other players' creations. It's super simple to browse for custom-made cities, intersections, buildings, and mods, and then apply them at the click of a button. It also has some great asset editors that help you create your own custom content, if you're the creative type. There's also some really cool mods out there. I like the ones that give you a new perspective on the world, like the first-person mod that lets you walk your city's streets. Or the flight and helicopter sim mods. Cool stuff. My personal favourite is the Tsunami Generator. You know, guys, when the most recent SimCity came out, we were all so excited, but then it ended up being really restrictive. City Skylines actually gives you the freedom to build the way you want to. I absolutely agree. This is the best city builder that is out there and well worth your time. Well, that's just about it for another show. Darren, what's the answer to your challenge? Oh, at the start of the show, I asked you, what is the name of the evil chef in Octodad Dadliest Catch? And the answer is... Chef Fujimoto. Oh, you know, octopus has to be cooked really carefully or it ends up tasting like a chewy piece of rubber. Oh, well, you should taste the sushi they make on Saturn. It's out of this world. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, next week on the show, we dance our way through Crypt of the Necrodancer. <laughs> So much fancy footwork in those games. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Bajo out. Darren out. Uh, you know, there was a time before I had my mobility base plate installed that I actually had retractable legs. Oh, really, Darren? Hey, does that mean you used to wear trousers? Oh, only the finest mohair trousers, Bajo. Oh, and corduroy sometimes. Mm, pics are it didn't happen, Darren. I want to yeah. see that. Oh, I've got loads of pics. Uh, you should have seen my mad slacks. No, you were such a fashionista. <laughs> oh, oh, oh.